making a movie with a psychopath is a little like poking a snake with a stick. Get on with your bloody work. Tell me what to do. <clears throat> you know they will hurt you. You just don't know exactly when or how badly. Get to work. It's part of oh, what I do. Off. Get to work. Meet Sam Vaknin. He's someone who's not afraid to talk about the demons inside his head. I lack conscience. I have no empathy. I am verbally abusive. I have horrifying rage attacks, which I, I'm unable to control and so on because I'm frustrated. Or the deficiencies of others. You're a hostile filmmaker. Hostile, ill-informed, intellectually lazy, ill-prepared, disorganized filmmaker. That's what you are. In fact, he may just be about the most honest person I know. It is not hard for me to admit that I'm a psychopath or that I have psychopathic traits. I display psychopathic behaviors. Or the best liar. So we've agreed to make a film to find out if it's true that maybe he was born without a conscience. I never intended to be dragged into the picture myself. I'd hoped the process might be educational. I thought it might even be fun. Boy, was I wrong about that. Oh, believe me, I haven't started to mistreat you. What goes on in the mind of a psychopath? And how could we spot one if they came into our lives? Sam Vagden was once a successful businessman in Israel. A multi-millionaire, he says. But now lives here in one of the poorest countries of Europe. I've come halfway around the world to follow up on something he told me in an interview several years ago. You see, Sam Vagden claims he's a psychopath. I'm not sure. I love to be hated. And I hate to be loved. What I am is indifferent. I just couldn't care less. I like to present a facade of the self-effacing, modest person. I call it in my book, false modesty. It's very, it works. It uh, gives other people the impression that I'm underneath it all, I'm human. You are human, aren't you? I firmly believe that you want to believe that, yes. If Sam is a psychopath, he's not the archetypal textbook kind. Most aren't so self-aware, for one. And they usually don't do long-term relationships. But Sam's been with his wife, Lydia, for more than 10 years. Is a psychopath's experience of love different to a normal person? Likely, likely so. Because he regards people as instruments of gratification and as disposable things to be used. She's living proof and living witness of my grandiosity. At our invitation, Sam's about to create a world first. He's the only civilian we know of to put themselves through the rigorous psychological and neurological testing required for a proper diagnosis of psychopathy. According to the accepted definition, psychopaths regularly do bad things to others, but feel fine and have no regrets. The bottom line is a problem with emotions like empathy. They just couldn't care less. They can mimic emotions, they can mimic uh, a genuine interest in you, when in fact there's really no interest beyond the interest that a cat has in a mouse, right? Think of the poor mouse. The poor mouse is saying, why is the cat doing this? And the cat is saying, huh, there's a mouse, and saying, and I'm a cat and it's a mouse and I do what cats do. Mr. the psychopath. I've used the term a social predator, and I think that's probably appropriate. But not all psychopaths do physical cruelty. I'm interested in the concept of the psychopath in a suit, the kind that doesn't fit the Hollywood stereotype of the sadistic serial killer or the kidnapper torturer from the nightly news. Sam's never physically violent. He wears nice clothes, he's clever, and can be a lot of fun. So how could he possibly qualify as a psychopath? They look the same, they, they may even appear to act the same as we do, but in the long term, what they have in mind is their own self-interest. They could often be quite charming, they can manipulate, they can con, deceive you uh, into thinking that there's something that they really are not. And it would take a long time before you actually realize that you're being used and abused. 
When it comes to the study of psychopaths, Professor Bob Hare is the recognised world leader. After more than 30 years working inside Canada's high security prisons, though, Hare thinks maybe he's been looking in the wrong place. If you're very bright, you know how to dress well, you have, say, the gift of gab, you're raised in an affluent family background, you don't go into the bank and rob it, you get in the bank and become a director. There are many more psychopaths out in the world than behind bars. One in every hundred, he says. They could be your relative, your neighbour, your lover, workmate or boss. Or even more likely, your boss's boss. If you're fairly attractive, that opens up all sorts of doors for you. If you're intelligent, even more doors. The combination of good looks, intelligence and lack of conscience is deadly. And on issues like these, he and Sam mostly agree. The vast majority of psychopaths, like an iceberg, are under the water. And like an iceberg, they are inert. They do nothing. They're just there. They torment their spouse by being unempathic, but they don't beat her or kill her. They, they bully co-workers, but they don't burn the office. You know, they are not dramatic. They are pernicious. They are, most psychopaths are subtle. They are more like poison than a knife. And they are more like slow working poison than cyanide. Sam does have some good reasons to think he's a psychopath. His biography is certainly full of stranger than fiction moments. His CV peppered with dubious job descriptions. I lost all my money and we're talking millions of dollars, three times in my life. But my research tends to back up much of his chaotic rags to riches to rags tale. I have divorced her once. I have married twice. I change jobs on average every year and a half. My life is utter chaos. Sam's biggest fall came in 1995, when he went to jail in Israel for a major securities fraud. I have hit rock bottom so many times that finally it penetrated even my thick skull that something was wrong with me. Today, our diagnostic roadshow leaves from Skopje. On paper, at least, Sam Backman seems like a good choice for a corporate psychopath test subject. He's a proven master at self-promotion and reinvention. The former corporate criminal has set himself up on the internet as a guru on narcissism, the personality disorder he was diagnosed with while in prison. And using his IQ of 185, he's made sure all the online traffic on the subject leads to him. It helps boost the proceeds of his self-published book, a perpetrator turned whistleblower perspective on what he calls malignant self-love. We have to take the DVD. Can we take our book also, Malignant Self-Love? Just a second, how many do you need? Six, six Malignant Self-Love. You always miss four. Six, I want to give each, each person a, a copy. Over the coming weeks, Sam's claims will be put to the test. Some of the leading psychopathy researchers in Europe have agreed to take part in the evaluation and scoring and in scanning his brain. Then we can find out for sure if he is the psychopath he thinks he is. Why make this movie? I think the movie touches on, on a very, very interesting uh, topic. Is the brain really the seat of the mind? Can the two disciplines match psychology and neuroscience? Like Sam, I've read all the books, but I'm curious what it's like to be around a psychopath up close and personal, to find out what happens when they drop their mask. It's a rare opportunity to try to capture their manipulative behaviour on video. One thing's for sure, psychopaths don't play by other people's rules. So I guess I'm deliberately putting myself in the firing line. Before leaving, I wade through my camera tapes, hours of Sam talking about himself from our first meeting two years ago. And I'm reminded of Sam's special promise to me about what might happen if the movie doesn't go his way. So can I expect that you will fuck me over at some point in the process of making this film?
I would not hesitate to, to inflict on you grave professional and, and financial damage. If you forgot to put something in there, or if you left anything open-ended, or if you left anything to the goodwill of the narcissist or the psychopath, he will fuck you over. If only for the kick of it. I do believe Sam when he says this. My only defence is to keep some kind of camera handy at all times to record his methods and their effects on me. I don't particularly enjoy doing the video diary thing. It's not really my thing. Uh, but um, I do want to remember what I'm feeling at, at any particular time during this adventure because um, part of me is worried that, um, that I'm in some way going to be changed for the worse by this encounter. We touch down in what's arguably still the central business hub of Europe. It's a great place to be studying the corporate psychopath. Sam says that during his days as a high-flying businessman, he used to live not far from here. It was a five-storey mansion. This is when you were rich. This is when I was rich. I hired a butler. I stole the butler from uh, Faye Dunaway. Wow. He was Prince Charles' butler. Butler or no butler, I'm more interested in finding out if Sam really has what it takes to be a successful psychopath. Is he quite as mad and bad as he likes to make out? Belinda Board should be able to tell us. The Australian-born organisational psychologist is a familiar sight around the streets of London's financial district. She made headlines in 2005 when she published a study which found a high degree of psychopathic traits amongst the UK's top-ranking business executives. I think the reason, in all honesty, it got so much publicity was because there was a great caption for all the journals, which was, you know, is your boss a psychopath? Board compared personality disorder profiles amongst criminals, mental patients and business leaders. She found the CEOs were more histrionic than the other groups and just as narcissistic and compulsive. The bosses, it seems, just weren't as antisocial. Personality disorders are not these discrete illnesses, if you will, inverted commas, discrete diseases, using that medical model where you either have it or you don't. But actually, these perhaps are just extensions of normal characteristics that each of us have, just in varying degrees. Whoa. Today, Belinda Board is to add Sam to her database. Have a seat. Thank you. First, allow me to burden you with my... Some circles considered to be a book. Here we are. Thank you. You're most welcome. So what I'll do first is if I can just ask you some basic questions and say about who you are. May I ask your age? 47. And your personal status. Would you say you're married and together? My wife believes I am. <laughs> Married, separated, divorced. Married, married, married. Married and together. Married. Sam begins with a charm offensive, but secretly is unimpressed by the psychologist's tool of choice. Board uses one of the most popular clinical tests of its kind. It involves 162 true-false questions designed to hone in on the 11 most recognised personality disorders. I can't help wondering how honest Sam's answers will be. important people because it makes me feel important. One of the diagnostic criteria. True. I'm not subverting the test. I'm sure. just, just for the sake of the film, I'm reading aloud some questions and explaining what they pertain to. Don't worry, I'm not altering the responses. Things have gone pretty swimmingly till now, but a seemingly minor query about Sam's educational qualifications sparks a dispute which threatens to derail the day's proceedings. Why don't I ask you, what's the highest degree you've ever attained? PhD. A PhD. And where was that from? At Pacific University. Because I went on to your website yes. to try and look at the connection and I couldn't make it connect. Connect between what and whom? You know, when you, it says click on here. Oh. 
that's for brain bench, possibly. Mm, no, only PhD, and it just wouldn't link through. Oh. Did you? Did that was your dissertation published? Yes, it's in the Library of Congress. Right. I did a PhD. I defended it in 1983, and and the copy was deposited in the Library of Congress. Sam waits till our cameraman's left the room to voice his displeasure. And I'm left reaching for the camcorder. So it was a bit of a stupid exchange. Where's your university? Why you couldn't click on the link? What link? I'm sure there's no link whatsoever. I don't know what she's talking Where's Why you couldn't click on the link? Where can I see your PhD? What gives you the right to ask to see my PhD? Where can I see your academic degree? Both Sam and Lydia seem to think Belinda's doubtfulness is all my fault. You have history. You have my history. Is it the proof? You don't believe in the point? You believe her. You don't believe her. Sam and you believe her. And why does it show that you have, uh, like, okay, Sam is a psychopath, he must lie. It doesn't sound good. Yes, psychopaths lie to obtain goals. They don't lie just to lie, they lie to obtain goals. If a psychopath sees a woman and he wants her money, he would lie to her that he loves her. If a psychopath wants to obtain a job, he would lie that he has a PhD in conjunction with the job. A psychopath would not lie generally just to lie. Psychopaths are very goal oriented. They are like torpedoes or laser machines. You know? They're goal oriented. The status of Sam's alleged PhD becomes the thorn in the side of our relationship for the rest of our time together. Tomorrow I'm going to oh, yeah, sure. ask Belinda to substantiate her academic credentials. Her word is not good enough for me. I want to see proof that she is what she says she is and who she says she is. On the same vein, I might ask you to substantiate your alleged credentials. Not I don't even know if you are in Walker. You claim to be in Walker. I haven't seen your ID, your passport. Why are you smiling? I haven't seen that you are so adept with what you're doing. Right. I want to see proof that you are who you say you are. <laughs> okay. I can prove my dissertations. Can you prove your credentials? Not nothing. No, no I can't prove anything. I thought so. I thought you can't. Psychopaths are very good at lying don't like being caught out. But they usually weave in just enough truth to keep their victims confused. Sam, though, says he prefers using honesty as a weapon. In order to convey to you my displeasure, I informed you of what I think of your mental capabilities or lack thereof. And I am more than no, willing... fucking idiot. Yes, among other things. And more than, and I'm more than willing to do it again and again and again. Don't, don't make uh, any mistakes about it. Oh, no, I believe that. that right. Be true. To prove to you that, I, that this behaviour is under full control is that when you switched on the camera, I immediately stopped. I'm just getting used to the rules of engagement in Sam's game, but already they seem to be shifting. The agreement is that you shoot the phone and I talk. Yes, if you want that? me, give me the camera, you talk and I will shoot the phone. I can give you the camera. Do you want the camera? If, if, you, if you want... No, don't be charged. No, I'm not going to put Don't be child. You said, you said, if you, you we want can to swap talk. roles. You want to talk, I will hold it. If you want to talk, no, no, go you, ahead. You, if you want to swap roles, we can do that too. If you want to cross the lines and participate in the film, be my guest. You know. At this moment, I'm reminded of some advice Sam offers on his website. His How to Avoid the Wrath of the Narcissist is a list of five don'ts. Number one is never disagree or contradict the narcissist. Whoops. Direct I, I, one one thing I'm, I am interested in in your um, do's and don'ts of how to deal right. with a narcissist. Yeah. Right. Uh, what, how do you think I'm going? Because I don't think I'm doing that well on your on your do's I and don't don'ts. Think, I, I don't think you're interested to do well. I think essentially you're a very spoiled person uh -huh. and, and quite narcissistic. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think you're right. However, we have roles. For instance. I've made a commitment to you to be available at all times and so on and so forth and I believe that so far I've kept my word perfectly. Mm -hmm. I believe you're hostile, that's my working hypothesis and I believe I believe that I have sufficient evidence to substantiate that. But oh, you well, have... maybe that's my way of dealing no, with, with bullying. Oh believe me, I haven't started to mistreat you. If I wanted to if I wanted to give you a hard time, believe me, you would have been in a far worse mental shape than you are right now. Should I just quickly tell you what I did overnight? Sure, your agenda, your... And, and then I'll, I'll go through it with you. The next day, Belinda and Sam meet again to go over the results of his personality test. The questionnaire, yeah. and I think you said yesterday that you understand how it works, so... Yeah, I've written about it extensively. Yeah. It, takes, it takes those items and factors them in to the 11 dimensions, 
And so then what I come out with is, if you like, a profile, yeah, a PD okay. profile. Yeah. Here's the Sam first. scored highly on a range of personality so disorders, or PDs, commonly associated with psychopathy. If he was cheating, he's done a good job at faking crazy. Uh, that we're starting here with histrionic, mm -hmm. and it's coming in at a raw score of 10. And then you pick up at, with narcissistic, and then there's a gradual coming down, and the lowest raw score was for the dependent right. personality disorder. Then it starts to come up again with compulsive, down a little with passive aggressive, then going up relatively quite high with paranoid, then you're going up relatively very high with schizotypal, down a little bit on the schizoid, and then peaking at avoidant. Mm -hmm. Sam's narcissism, though, doesn't show up as much as he might have expected. Because you said yesterday a couple of times, you know, I'm a narcissist and mm -hmm. that's why I'm, according to this, actually not significantly different to any of these mm -hmm. four populations. Well, it's a fair assumption that these are, well, unusual uh, populations. And narcissism seems to be more prevalent in these populations than in the general population. That Belinda has lined up Sam's scores against her other groupings of businessmen, psychiatric patients and criminals. And according to her, it's the shape of the graph tracking his profile that tells the real story. The blue line is the psychiatric population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me, there was a very close relationship in the trend of the shape. Yes, the comparison shows Sam's profile more akin to those kept in a psychiatric ward than those ruling the boardroom. And Belinda suspects his evangelistic narcissism could be some sort of curious con job. If I strip everything else away and I just look at the narcissism, which is really what this is about, he seemed to almost wear it as a badge. And I wonder if we took that badge away, because he didn't score significantly higher, what would that mean to him? What would that mean to his sense of self? And what would that mean to his way of life? I'm left not quite knowing what to think. Could Sam be faking at being a psychopath? And if so, wouldn't that probably qualify him as one anyway? And I wonder what it'd be like for Lydia living with a wannabe psychopath. Today, it'll be her turn to face the music. We're off to a town north of Manchester, where Lydia's to meet with an expert who's been trying to understand the women who fall in love with psychopaths. I'm keen to know if she fits the pattern of a typical victim. Someone with high empathy who's good at sharing. At 39, Lydia's keen to have a baby, but time's running out. I do want to have a child, but uh, I don't know. Look, I'm in a critical age. If I want really to have, then I have to have it now. And according to Sam, Lydia's deeply unsure about his capacity to be a good father. Lydia would be a fabulous mother. It's such a pity. And she doesn't know what to do. She's trapped. She wants a child. She can't have it with me. She's realised that for many reasons. But she loves me in a way, probably dearly. She's also probably addicted to me and my way of life. And Sam's way of life isn't easy. That night over dinner, my camcorder captures one of their almost daily flare-ups. I want to understand. Don't hit me. I don't get understand. up from here and fuck off from here. Why are you getting angry? I'm, I'm because you don't relevant. listen what I'm talking about. You don't listen what I'm... You don't want to try even to understand what I'm talking about. You don't. It's not first time. It happened a few times on this trip. I'm fed up. I'm beginning to be fed up. I'm telling you that. I'm what going is wrong? I'm going out. What is wrong with reading a book? <laughs> but it wasn't always like this. When Lydia and Sam first got together, it was a whirlwind courtship full of romance. We met and he said, I know what I want. I love you. I said, I beg your pardon. It was like thunder from no clouds, it was, you know, very weird. I said, wow, this guy gets what he wants. 
That's it. Actually, in effect, I needed some uh, person like that. Lydia's made her way to an intimate, out-of-the-way pub for her session with the psychology researcher, Christine Kirkman. It has been commented on in the academic literature that the only way to really access the psychopath is to be able to contact uh, and interview people who had real-life experiences of them. The questionnaire she's asked Lydia to fill out about Sam has thrown up some interesting issues on both sides. The second schedule was about the personality characteristics um, of, in this case, your husband. And this is what makes it unusual, because in actual fact, uh, the women that we interviewed, none of them were with their partners. Okay. They had all separated from them. Mm -hmm. So maybe they were more bitter than what you are. The P-scan devised by psychopathy pioneer Bob Hare is a rough screener for psychopathic traits. But Christine's twist is getting the women partners to fill out the forms in order to rate their problematic men. Accompanied by her trusty note-taker, she's interviewed around 600 women like Lydia. I can't really be certain. I can't give you these answers as my final answers. So most of them are ones, for example. But if I were to say, that, for example, that he <coughs> lies easily while looking you in the eye, no, I can't uh, say it as a sentence, he is a liar, <laughs> because he isn't. You say on here about the antisocial pursuit of power through being aggressive or... He is not physically aggressive. But verbally he is. But verbally he can be very aggressive. Uh, he prevails all the time. He doesn't listen to the other. He doesn't listen to me what I'm saying. There is no really conversation when he is in the mode of aggression or rage. In yeah. such situations, I get up and I go. Does he make rules for you or punish you in any way if you don't stick no, to his I, rules? No, I, I make rules to him. I see. I put rules. When I tell him, don't leave this towel here. OK, he will not leave it then there, but the next time he will, he will put it. So yeah. I make a rule. Now, rule 2515. Mm. Don't put your towel there. She makes the rules and she sets the parameters. I would consider that saying to somebody, rule 2001, you do not put the towels in here, is not abusive, quite challenging. Later in the day, Lydia fronts up for Christine Kirkman's verdict. Two strong results have come out of the morning session. One is that Lydia has plenty of potential to make a good victim. In actual fact, uh, your scorings uh, on, on this particular schedule demonstrated that you were a person who had very high empathic tendency. It correlates with a lot of other things. High emotionality, uh, kindness, cries easily, uh, things that touch them. And in that region, you had a high score, and that was in line with the other ladies that we interviewed. But Sam's psychopathy score, on Lydia's reckoning, is low. In the interview, we looked at the schedule of abusive behaviours, things such as punishment, rules, humiliation, constant criticism, character assassination. Those abusive behaviours for yourself, the incidence of them was extremely low in comparison to the other ladies. It is one of those things that is quite impossible to interpret is how much denial a person has. Does she see herself as being a victim? This is what is important. And she does not see herself as being a victim because she claims that he is the best person that she's ever met. <laughs> The idea that generally being a good person makes you a perfect victim for a psychopath seems wildly unfair to me. But cheaters always need suckers. And I'm desperately trying not to be one. I've been up half the night, delving deeper into Sam's past. Maybe I am becoming the hostile filmmaker he says I am. When I leave the carriage for a moment, my cameraman 
captures Sam telling Lydia he spent much of the trip spying on me from the seat behind. Uh, he described me as a fraud, a swindler, a criminal that is victimising people, lying about my dissertation and da -da -da -da. The papers that I saw there totally support my view that he's a hostile filmmaker. By the time I return, they both seem convinced my only mission is that I'm out to destroy them. If you reach the conclusion or you came with the concept or with the conception that here's this conman who is bilking money out of people, falsifying his credentials, you know, doesn't know what he's talking about and stuff like that, then go. I mean, go for it. Uh, and the result will be kind of pornographic film of, you know, another Hannibal Lecter roaming the earth and, and cheating people. Yeah, yeah. Statistically, according to the lowest figure acceptable, there are 8 million psychopaths in the United States. So what did you do? You made, made a movie, another movie about a psychopath? Who? It will be of interest to whom? Even not to me, I'm not sure I will ask you for copies. Next stop on our scientific odyssey is Tübingen, a medieval town where medicine and digital technology are coming together to help discover how the brains of psychopaths might be different. Hi. Professor Dr. Bimbo. Yeah, Salama. nice seeing you. Nice yeah. to meet you. Uh, take, take away Salama. your stuff. Lydia. Yeah, yeah Niels Burbaumer is someone Sam's been wanting to meet for some time. Most of the psychopaths who usually visit his lab arrive in handcuffs with armed guards. Today's test subject is making scientific history, the first civilian volunteer to seek out a diagnosis. We forget the successful psychopaths because they are not studied. They don't come to the attention of, of the science, but also not to the attention of the social system because they, they are not criminal. They are not violently, viciously violent, and that's why we don't know them. But the impact of society is tremendous. It was never studied. Waiting for the official test to determine whether he really is a psychopath, Sam seems unfazed. He gives the impression he might even be pleased if he gets a high score. But I wonder what it'll mean for Lydia and her plans to make a family with him. Niels Burbaumer uses the most recent update of the shorter screening version of the Psychopathy Checklist, or PCL. It's the gold standard measurement tool for psychopathy and virtually impossible to cheat. Now. There is, of course, a possibility that I'm not a psychopath, <laughs> which would, which would <laughs> that, solve a lot of problems. A, that would be a tragic that would for be these devastating. Cool guys. That yeah, would be devastating. devastating. I'll have to kill someone to, <laughs> to the last scene. Yes. You know? And this time, Sam's assessors won't just be relying on his goodwill in order to get to the truth. They're armed with what's known as collateral information about his past, including interview transcripts with members of his family in Israel. Sam doesn't know they've got these. So begins a cat and mouse game which lasts a couple of hours, where Sam is questioned in depth across a range of sensitive topics relating to different psychopathic traits. The, your symptomatology, assuming that it is a symptomatology, is also something you make your money out now, your living. Oh, out. absolutely. I leverage, yeah. I leverage my alleged mental illness uh, into yeah. commercial success. So a very good idea. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Verbal, uh, uh, your verbal aggression and aggressiveness. How often does that happen, like very with your wife? Uh, very often. Very often? Very often. Daily, sometimes a few times. Oh, really? Yes. I wouldn't have thought that. That's amazing. I regard life as a giant supermarket and... That you take I, what it comes. I stroll among the shelves and okay. whatever comes to mind. It's totally, un, totally itinerant, totally peripatetic, totally unplanned, totally impulsive, totally... That is psychopathic. Okay? That is psychopathic, Definitely. yes. But I thought that you had a very good relationship with your mother. Uh, good relationship with my mother? No. With your mother? My mother was the, the, the physically abusive person. Ah. She, she abused me physically. I thought that she was the one who was very close to you and you loved her. And Blah, 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 uh, blah. Not really, no. I, I love my father more than my mother. Oh, really? Various details of Sam's difficult childhood emerge during his PCL session. They raise interesting questions about whether psychopaths are born bad or whether their environment creates their condition. According to Adrian Rain, a leading expert on the criminal brain, 
we should have some sympathy for the psychopath. It might not be all their fault. I think psychopaths start off in life as damaged goods. They don't choose to be physically and sexually abused. They don't choose to have the negative genetic predisposition to a psychopathic personality. They, in a sense, are propelled by forces beyond their control into a psychopathic way of life. And in doing so, they also wreak havoc on everyone around them and in turn perhaps give rise to the next generation of psychopaths insofar as we believe that abuse and neglect early on in life is one of the risk factors for a psychopathic personality. So there's almost a cycle of psychopathy. But others are just as adamant that there's nothing to prove conclusively that psychopaths are really slaves to their genes or their environment. It's not uncommon for somebody, particularly psychopathic individuals, to claim that in their early childhood, uh, youth and so forth, that there were some traumatic events that happened and this helped to either trigger off their psychopathic behaviour or make them into what they are right now. But the literature is not really supportive of that. Uh, psychopaths come from a variety of backgrounds, good, in between, bad backgrounds, uh, wonderful families, terrible families. Uh, it doesn't seem to make a heck of a lot of difference. In recent years, MRI scanning has proved useful at pinpointing how the brains of psychopaths might be different. If Sam is a psychopath, it's likely the emotion processing parts of his brain aren't firing properly. So the Tubing and team have devised an experiment to find out. They're pitting husband and wife against each other in a battle to see who best controls their emotions. They'll use a process known as a real-time neural feedback loop. It's a bit like creating a kind of brain gymnasium where the participants do mental bench presses. So we give the subject a trial and error chance, ask them to watch their brain, and try to manipulate it in a trial and error fashion. And the computer is just waiting for the right response. And the moment the right response appears, it says, great, now, again. Lydia is used as the healthy control subject. She's asked to turn her emotions on and off by recalling both happy and sad events from her life. So it, it will stay in the middle when you are just relaxed during the blue phase, but during the red phase you see that the thermometer is going up and down. And your task is to make it go up. Via this simple thermometer graphic, Lydia is shown live visual feedback of her brain activity. After a short time, she learns to move the meter up and down. During this period, we extract signals from a part of the brain called the insula, which is very important for emotional regulation. Lydia's result, with only one session, sees her insula lighting up. Like most of us, the scanner shows she can control her emotions. Sam's stint in the brain gym starts off badly, so he's given more than one chance. It's soon clear, though, Sam is showing almost no ability to regulate his emotions, nor the capacity to learn how. Emotionally, he's flatlining. Sam has shown clearly what psychopathy researchers describe as cold emotion. What you see here, it's an orthographic view of the brain. Mm -hmm. This is Lydia's uh, one single session data. I have an emotional wife. On average, we have normal emotions. To Look at this. Look at you. OK, here is your data from the same region. And you see that it's almost but hugging the zero. In fact, it is going down. There is no marked difference between the green and the blue blocks. Do you understand now how come when I tell him I love you, he doesn't feel anything? It's just empty words, so I don't tell him anymore. Something like that. No, it's not true I, I don't feel It's not true I don't feel anything. I feel reassured. I feel reassured. Lydia can joke about it, but I can't help wondering how she feels deep down about such a one-sided love. Maybe it's mean, but I want to get Lydia's reaction to some of the callous things Sam has said about her so far during our trip. Even an extent and in a certain sense, she does not exist. She's a reflection or a sort of a tabula rasa. 
blank slate where anything could be written and anything would be equally, equally correct, equally right. It's a great pity. Isn't this partly why you've cho you chose her? Possibly, yes. Possibly. Psychopaths and narcissists choose easily malleable people. Not only spouses, but easily malleable people. If you make a list of her needs and her preferences and her priorities, virtually none of them is getting fulfilled. She wants a child, she has no child. She is a healthy sexual woman, she has no sex. She wants love, she gets a pale, a pale imitation of love. What do you think? It's not normal love, but he loves strongly. I wouldn't say that uh, he doesn't love me because I see what he's doing and uh, how he shares and he is very intimate with me. I did not believe in love. I was a teenager, I believe something will happen, the prince on the white horse, but in the real life it doesn't really happen. You know, no princess on white horses came to my door. so. I gave up love. I found Sam. After all the high-tech brain scanning, it's back to pen and paper for the critical final session in Tübingen. Time to find out Sam's score on his official psychopathy rating. Four, six, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. Uh, That's the American cutoff score. Borderline, yes. Uh, the European one is 13. 13, right? 13, yes. The Europeans are. No, so for European standards, you're, you're, you're a real psychopath. I'm a real psychopath. But in, in America. But, zero okay. but the truth of Sam's score is no laughing matter. It's 18 out of 24. The exact cutoff point for a fully fledged psychopath. I expected to fail the test. I believed that I would have a score of 10 to 12. Because I believe that I'm more of a narcissist than a psychopath, far more. I think my psychopathic traits are ancillary. They're, they're not very important. And a score of 18 was a bit of a shock to me, a bit of a shock. The vast majority of people would receive a score of zero or one. Uh, a score of 18 would be obtained by uh, perhaps one or slightly less than 1%. So 18, compared with the general population is enormously high. And in fact, if you went into a prison and looked at the distribution of uh, screening version scores, it would probably be around 12 or 13, not 18. 18 is very, very high. His positions are, are knowledgeable, scholarly, highly sophisticated, much more sophisticated than what I find in science. What is missing? is a theory and a concept of the causes. And, of course, a good theory and a good concept of the changes, how you want the changes. But that fits again psychopathy. First of all, you don't want the change. Second, you're not really interested why you are the way you are. But it's beautiful to describe that type of behavior. <laughs> He's marvelously psychopathic in that sense. <laughs> For me, the implications of Sam's positive diagnosis haven't really had time to sink in. Like a lot of people who enter the web of a psychopath, maybe I've seriously underestimated his power and my own potential as a victim. Today, our scheduled portrait session quickly goes pear-shaped. Without having provoked him in any way I know about, I'm again being treated like the enemy. Stop with the pleasantries. Get on with your bloody work. Tell me what to do. <clears throat> I was Stop with your pretensions. Will you? Your Australian good manners. I'm Get sorry, to work. Sam. It's part of oh, what I do. Fuck off. Get to work. Sam's temper tantrums were vaguely amusing at first, but now they're really starting to bother me. Even when he's the one locking himself in my hotel bathroom, I don't feel like I'm the one in control. More and more, it seems like he's chosen me to make this movie rather than the other way around. One of the myths around psychopaths is that they have an almost supernatural ability to successfully target the vulnerable. But what do we know about how good psychopaths really are 
at spotting a victim. Recently, Canadian researcher Angela Book devised a simple experiment to test just this. Her curiosity came from a throwaway line from a famous serial killer. I got this idea from a quote from Ted Bundy, who often is cited as being a psychopath. He said he could tell a victim by the tilt of her head as she walked. And that really struck me. I, I wondered, you know, is that even possible? To test Bundy's chilling claim, Book chose a random sample of walkers, but included one person who'd been the victim of a violent crime, a rape or serious mugging. It took the psychopaths only seconds to work out who was the odd one out. So for people who scored higher on psychopathic traits that relate to manipulation and lack of empathy, they were more accurate in predicting who was a victim and who was not, just from watching the 15 second videos. So what you can see here is that her arms are not moving in synchrony with her legs, in fact. One side was, but the other side, in fact, was not. So that would be something that you wouldn't want to be doing if you didn't want to be seen as a victim. And it is spooky. We're nearing the end of our time together, and I'm starting to think that I must be one of the ones with the funny walk. I'm in a panic, too, that I've got too little evidence of what I consider the real Sam on video. Much more than I've been able to film, Sam's been bullying and verbally abusing me on an irregular and seemingly irrational basis from day one. He's been a genius at doing it only when our main camera is safely packed away. It's the last scheduled stop on our adventure. And for our final day together, we've planned a special visit to a unique archive of psychopathic brains. But it wasn't to be. The day had started badly. I'd grown weary of Sam's off-camera tirades against me. They were now getting more frequent and more vicious. This time, I was determined his behaviour wouldn't go unrecorded. Sheet face. Sorry? Sheet face. Pick your nose nice. and lick your fingertips. Do something you're good at. You got that? And lick I don't, your... I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't really want to work. Got that. I don't want to work like this. I don't want to work like this. this. That's your only That's what I think about you. You're fucking idiot. Sheet face. Everything. Now, take all this into consideration. What do you want to do? Um, you are on a catch-22. What to do here? It's like breach the contract, and I'll be delighted. I buy my own tickets, baby. No, breach, I, 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 Sam, I'm not breach. interested in fighting with you about and money. I'm not about, interested in your shit money. face. Money. I'm not interested in your shit face. I'm, I'm really not interested. You're the most in narcissistic it. person I've seen. You're the voice of a croaking frog, and you fancy yourself a singer. You're an idiot. So here we are. Do you want to go or not? I know you're trying to punish me, but I'm, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm trying to punish you. You're so inconsequential. I'm trying to manipulate you into doing the movie that I want you to do. Well, okay. So. Good luck. Well, if, if you want to take this cab, I'm happy to, to um, give you the day off. Well, I don't guess I could promise, you know, you'll stop Why are you abusing shaking? me. Why because, you because I do not like being bullied. We all, we all don't like certain things in life, but life is life, you know. Certain things are unchangeable. I don't like conflict, Sam, but, um, you know, well, you it seem seems to like... Be, you seem to be courting it left, right and centre. <laughs> I'm astounded that only minutes later, Sam can calmly and coldly slip into the third person and dissect the whole incident, giving us some helpful tips on bullying at the same time. Your body was flooded instantly with adrenaline and its derivatives, like norepinephrine and so on. Now, when, when these hormones pervade the bloodstream, your brain reacts. It shuts down certain centers and activates others. This is called a stress reaction, or a stress syndrome, actually. Then when the abuse recedes, the uh, adrenaline levels begin to drop. As they drop, the entire system goes into mayhem. So what bullies usually do 
they start and stop, start and stop. That achieves the maximal stress syndrome. And this is the great secret of bullying. Never overdo it. Small doses. The victim will do the rest. Although you are shaking much less, I must do something about it. This is classic stuff, typical of a psychopath. I should be happy. But even though I've finally captured Sam's abusive behaviour on camera, I'm not sure I can properly explain the real effect he's had on me. I call it quits for the day. Enough is enough. It's a hasty and cheerless farewell. Early the next morning, Sam and Lydia will leave to return to Skopje. The way I feel right now, I'll be happy never to see them again. That night, I hang up my hat and shave my beard, a kind of cleansing ritual. I'm thankful at last for some time free of torment. Most of the psychopaths will actually have the victims ended up by thinking that they're the problem and uh, one can bully, manipulate and con them and rather than responding by either leaving or fighting back, they often will take it and think that he's right. You know, everything he says is right, there's something wrong with me and I deserve all of this. And it's pretty sad. Bob Hare's right. And for months afterwards, parts of Sam's taunts still come flooding back to haunt me. If you're a bit smarter than I give you credit for, you will lay in bed and you will think, OK, Sam told me many bad things. He did it malevolently. But now let's try you know, the wheat out of the shaft. Let's try to see what of what he said is meaningful. What could be helpful? Which of the things he said are true for me and describe me accurately? And what can I do to change them? Back at home, another part of the Sam experience still bugs me. It's the dispute over Sam's academic credentials. And I'm still baffled as to why it became such a big deal. Somewhere amongst my old research tapes, I try to find proof of what I remember as Dr Sam actually bragging about his ill-gotten degree. Yeah. The PhD was acquired in a diploma mill. Diploma mill in the United States means a place where you buy your, your degrees. So it's a diploma mill. I'm not a real PhD. You're uh, a doctor, though. Technically, I am a PhD. I, I uh, worked two years. I presented a thesis. The thesis was uh, reviewed by peers. It is uh, in, the, in the Library of Congress, you can see it. But between you and me, that's not the rigorous PhD that people are led to believe when you use the, the title. Sam has played me like a violin. But that's what real psychopaths are good at. So maybe I shouldn't feel so stupid about getting caught up in his game. It happens to the best of us. The victims all have something in common, and that is that they're human. And everybody can be victimised. I have been victimised. I have been conned and manipulated by psychopaths, and I should know better, but how do you know? If we believe in the fundamental goodness of man, we're doomed. I can't say I miss Sam, but I can thank him for the insights he's given me into the ways and minds of the psychopaths we encounter in our everyday lives. Making a movie with a psychopath is one thing. Taking advice from them about how you should live your life is a whole other kind of madness. Yeah.